turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1 is where we're going to be, and we'll be there here in just a moment. Man, I'm excited that you're here today. I know it's, it's the Sunday before Christmas, and um, it's, some of you guys may be visiting some family today. Some of you guys may be traveling through, and some of you guys are just here because it's what you're supposed to do at Christmas time, and I get that, but I'm glad you're here. And, and I hope everybody had a chance to fill out a connection card and drop in the offering plate. If not, you can drop it in the bucket on your way out. But this is, this is our last week of our Thrill of Hope Christmas series. And it's, it's kind of sad because I've really enjoyed this series. And, uh, but if you haven't been here, what we've done is we've taken the Christmas narrative and we basically have looked at a different character every week and just pulled out some takeaways from that and uh, maybe what God has for us for that, that, that passage. And uh, so week one, we talked about Zechariah's story. Uh, week two, we talked about Mary's story, and then we looked at the shepherd's story, and then last week, we looked at the wise men, and uh, just kind of pulled out some different things from each one of those, and today, we're going to bring it full circle, and uh, the question today is really important because we looked at everybody else's story, but this morning, I want to ask us a question is, what about your story? What about my story? How do we fit in? So we looked at all these other people in this Christmas narrative, but what about us? Every week we've taken some takeaways from this and try to see where we can apply it to our life. But really, this is where it comes down to, okay, what about you and what about me? Like, what about us? And we look at this manger scene. We look at this thing about Christmas and baby Jesus. But what about it? What about your story? Because really, that's ultimately what it's about today. How do you and I fit in? Can we see ourselves in that story? And if so, where? And what does God have for us Because it didn't stop 2,000 years ago when he came. When he was born in the manger and the shepherds and then the wise men came later. It didn't stop there. You and I, we have a story that's intertwined with that. So what about it? How do we fit into that? Each week we looked at a story of somebody involved in that Christmas narrative. And everybody we looked at, everybody, their hope revolved on how they responded to that baby. Everybody we looked at in that story, their hope in life revolved around what they did with baby Jesus. It all hinged on that one thing of what did they do with this Messiah who was born. And so today, the same is true for us. What we do with this Messiah, what do we do with him? Is he just still a baby in this manger? It's a really cool story this time of year that we set up our manger scenes and and put up our Christmas trees. Or is it more? How do we respond to the Savior who was born? Because church, I want you to get this this morning. If you don't get anything else, we got to get this because our hope today is still tied to what we do with Jesus. Our hope today, that your hope and my hope is still tied to how we respond to the Messiah. And our theme has been thrill of hope. We, we sang that song, man. They did a great job singing Oh Holy Night this morning. Let me just, I just want to quote some of that because this is what's wrapped all around. It says, Oh Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. This is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till He appeared. And then when He appeared, the soul felt its worth. It's like we finally realized who we were in God when he appeared. That's what this song is trying to get across. And then it it ties in that phrase, a thrill of hope. That same world who was longing for value and longing for an identity found it in Christ. Because it says, a thrill of hope, that weary world rejoices. Because yonder breaks a brand new and a glorious morning. And that is something. Because we're talking about hope. We're talking about hope and these words, a thrill of hope. And I want us to think about that for just a moment. I don't know, I mean, I know we talked about it every week. But just for a moment, I just think about that phrase, a thrill of hope. An exciting hope. A hope that is alive. I want you to think about what does that mean to you? What does that mean for you? We're part of that weary world. We're part of that world that's just trying to make it through the next day. That's just trying to raise a family. Just trying to get through this life with all of the mountains and valleys and giants and trials that come along. And that's us. And so think about what it means to have this hope. 
In the New Testament, we find this word hope a lot. And the Greek word is elpis. And here's what it means. It means a joyful and confident expectation of something. A joyful and confident expectation. Almost to anticipate, usually with pleasure. Like this excited waiting of something you know is going to happen. Of something we really believe is going to take place. And so this idea of hope. Well, in your Bibles, in 1 Peter chapter 1, if you don't have it, we'll have the words up on the screen. But here's what Peter says. And you're like, okay, wait a minute. We're not in Luke 2 or Matthew 2. This is not a Christmas message. It is. Because Peter just hits it right, I mean, right in the bullseye when he we talks about this little passage here tucked away in 1 Peter. He says this, starting in verse 3 of chapter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. If you underline, if you mark in your Bible, some people don't do it. Listen, I'm at, mark it, underline it, dog ear that page, put your bulletin in there, memorize it, man, whatever you got to do, because this is the whole, if you were to boil down Christianity, real true Christianity to one statement, it's this, born again to a living hope, being made brand new to a hope that's exciting, to some, a hope that's alive. It's not dead. It's not fading away. It is real. It's true. And we're excited about it but it all has to do with how we respond to Jesus because keep reading he says we've been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead so he talks about what our hope is it's alive it's exciting we're born again to this thing and then he tells us where we find it through the resurrection of Jesus Christ then in verse 4 to an inheritance that is imperishable it's undefiled It's unfading, and it's kept in heaven for you. Verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. So listen, sidebar here, but super important. As a believer, a lot of times we struggle with doubting our salvation. We struggle with, am I really saved? Like, I know I gave my life to Christ, I know, but sometimes I don't feel saved. And sometimes, man, life just beats the living daylights out of me. And I feel like I'm just laying out there just trying to, try to just trudge through. And we're like, is God really there? And we're like, am I really saved? Mark this down. Because here's what he talks about our salvation. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, crucified, buried, and raised from the dead, he said it's imperishable not going to die it's undefiled it's not going to be corrupted it's unfading and it's kept in heaven for you i love this he says and it's guarded by god it doesn't get much stronger than that we can rest and so you're like man he's really excited about this hope you know why because i know that jesus is mine and i am his and i know that he's more than just a baby in a manger to me he's my savior and my lord and because of that i have a living hope That no matter what happens to me, no matter what happens in this life, no matter how hard or difficult it gets, nothing's going to change the fact that when I die, I get to spend eternity with Jesus Christ in heaven forever and forever in the glorious place that he has created for us. That's why, that's that's what Peter's talking about here. Man, that's a living hope. Get this, he's not done yet. It gets even better. In verse six, he says, in this, you rejoice. You see that word used in Luke chapter 2 when the angels come to the shepherds and say, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Rejoice. He said, this this leads you, in this you rejoice. Why? Because our hope leads to joy. Not happiness. Church, listen to me. Happiness is based on our circumstances. And it can change based on whether things are going good or things are going bad. But joy is different. He says, we rejoice in this because our hope leads to joy. And maybe you're here this morning and maybe you're struggling. John, I am struggling with joy. Man, the stuff I'm going through, I'm having a hard time pinpointing the joy in my life. It might be because your hope has shifted to something different than Jesus. Because in this, we rejoice. You're like, well, you don't understand what I'm going through. Peter addresses that. Check out, this is awesome. He says, verse 6, look at it. In this you rejoice, though now... For a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. He says, even in this life, for a little while, as short as our life is, even if your life is just one 
struggle after another. He says, even if for a little while your life is full of trials and struggles and mountains that you can't climb and valleys you don't feel like you can get out of and giants you have no idea how you're going to defeat. He says, in this we still rejoice no matter what. Because if our hope is in Christ, the byproduct of our hope is joy. Look in verse 8. He says, though you have not seen him, talking about Jesus, he says you love him. And Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. And here's this phrase again, and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible. Can't describe it. You can't put words to it. Like you can't, you can't even try to explain your joy to somebody. They just can't get it. But you know what? The world sees it and they can't describe it or explain it. And it does something to them. It draws them to want to know where is this coming from? How is this person who's going through this little while of trials, how are they even having joy in their life? He says, we believe in him and we rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and it's filled with glory. It's glorious. Obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Your joy won't go away. You know why? Because it's not found in who we are, but it's found in who He is. And our joy isn't found in what I can do, but it's only found in what He's already done. And some of us are chasing joy in this life, and it seems like it just always just kind of goes right through our fingertips. The Bible actually calls it this. It's like we're chasing the wind. You'll never grab it. You'll never catch it. And if I always keep trying to catch joy in other areas of life other than in Christ, I'll never get it. But if I understand that it's not found in who I am, but who He is, and if it's not found in what I can do, but what He's done, then it's a joy that I understand that is a living hope. Hope doesn't, you know, hope doesn't mean much when we're comfortable, does it? Like when everything's going good, Hope doesn't mean a whole lot. I, hope doesn't mean much when we're comfortable or satisfied, when we're really safe, when we're warm and fed. In, in fact, when we often likely to feel there's no need for hope when everything's going well. Hope was, after all, made for times of disaster and difficulty. When we're too comfortable, get this church, this is so important to us today. When we're too comfortable, we are more likely to fall asleep than we are to hope. I think that's one of the biggest things that's wrong with our churches in our country today. For 200 years, we have enjoyed, man, just peace. In our, I mean, we, we have relative freedom in our country. We don't get persecuted. Like, we're not being thrown in jail for our beliefs, at least not yet, right? And, and none of that stuff's happening. But here's what has happened in 200 years of our church history of our country. We've gotten comfortable. And we've almost got to the place where we really don't feel like we need to hope in anything anymore because everything's okay. We're not being stretched, and we're not being challenged, and it's not difficult, really all that difficult to go to church on Sunday and, and play the part of a believer, and so we've gotten really comfortable, and we've, also, we've lost the reason, at least, to find hope in Jesus. What it also does is it causes us to lose sight of the importance of meeting together as a church. We've kind of isolated ourselves as an individual. I really don't need a church family. I really don't need to live a life of community with other people in our church because I'm pretty comfortable. But when the church comes under persecution, and you see this in countries around the world where they are persecuted, it draws them closer to each other and it draws them closer to God because all they have is hope. That's it. This hope, comfort dulls our senses. It may push us to ignore the warning signs that the foundations of our lives are really shifting sand, then it's just waiting to collapse under the, the weight of our sin. But Jesus came to give us hope. But it all hinges on how we respond to the Savior. We looked the last several weeks at Luke chapter 2 and Matthew chapter 2, and we read through the narrative of Jesus' birth and how He fulfilled all these Old Testament prophecies that He was supposed to be born of a virgin that he was going to be born in Bethlehem, that he was going to be born of the lineage and the line of David, and all, I mean, just so many other. We're not going to break down all of them, but all these prophecies fulfilling to his birth. Jesus came as God in the flesh. He stepped out of heaven, the God of the universe, and he took on the form of man. 
And he dwelt among us. That, we get that word Emmanuel. God is with us. And one thing that we tend to forget about this time of year is that Jesus didn't stay a baby, right? He's not still in the manger. He's not still there. He, he grew up. That's not the end of the story. I, I, I love this. There's somebody who makes fun of me. But there's, there's this gospel song. It's just the end of the beginning, all right? That was just the end of the beginning. That was just the start of what God was going to be doing. I mean, he grew up and he started a ministry. And here's what he did. He healed untold number of people. He raised people from the dead. He fed tens of thousands of people with sack lunches. He made the lame to walk and he made the blind to see and he made the deaf to be able to hear. He performed countless other miracles that we don't even have even record of because John says, hey, there's so much more that Jesus did, we can't even write it down. It's so too much. But as wonderful as all that stuff was that he did, and amazing, church, you realize that's not why he came. Jesus didn't come to heal the physical deformities. Jesus didn't come to feed the physical bellies of people for a temporary time. He didn't come to walk this earth to do all kinds of really cool miracles. He was focused on one thing, just one, the cross. But it started there. But he was focused on one thing. Because his death and sacrifice was the only thing that would bring us, you and me, true hope. Everything he did was leading to that one moment. Remember he even told his mom, when he was 12 years old, I must be about my father's business. There's only one reason I'm here, and that's to die for you. Satan didn't want it. And you can look, and all throughout, Satan tried and tried and tried to prevent the cross from happening. He tried to get Joseph to put Mary away. When, when he found out that she was pregnant, he tried to kill baby Jesus through Herod. Remember last week, like Herod wanted to kill all the little kids that was born. He tried to play on Je- Jesus' humanity when he tempted him in the wilderness. He tried to play on Jesus' deity when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. And if you remember that passage, he was so stressed. He was sweating great drops of blood. This idea that God, the Holy One, was going to take on the unholiness and the sin of humanity. And Satan was trying to discourage and try to point this out during that time, trying to keep him from wanting to go through with it. And even at his trial, when he needed his friends the most, there was Peter denying him trying to discourage and keep him from going through with this. Because Satan knew that Jesus' death on the cross was not going to be a victory for himself, but it meant total defeat. Because at his death, he paid the price for my sin and eternal life for not just my sin, but for yours and for the whole of humanity. And that his death was only possible because of his birth. And our hope is only found, and our hope hinges on what we do with Jesus. So what do we do with this baby? There was four reactions that we see, and we're going to fly through these real quick at his birth. The first one is Herod. You remember King Herod from last week? He was the king of Israel, but he wasn't a Jew. The Roman government appointed Herod to be king, and, and he, didn't, he was power hungry. And when he found out this little baby was born, when he was told that this is going to be the king of the Jews, he hated what Jesus meant to his power. And he hated what Jesus meant to his position. And he hated what Jesus meant to his future as king. He hated the idea of his life having to change and not be king anymore. The second reaction we saw uh, even last week was from the religious people of the day. The scribes and the Pharisees. And, and what they did is they, they had access to all the Scripture that told them when he would be born or at least roughly the time and where and how they could be looking. But they totally missed out. And the reason the priest rejected him and the scribes and the religious people rejected him is because they were looking for a Savior. They were looking for the wrong one. They were looking for a political Savior, for a governmental Savior, somebody who would come in and kick the Romans out and bring Israel back to the glory days of Israel. And listen, church, we've got to understand, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, and remember the shepherds came and visited him, what did the Bible say the shepherds did right after they visited Jesus? They went and they told everybody. 
in Bethlehem and the surrounding area. They told everybody, hey, the angels came to us and said the Savior is born, and here's where he's at. Listen, Bethlehem was only a couple miles outside of Jerusalem. Word got back to the religious people in Jerusalem that Jesus, the Messiah, was born. But they were looking for a political Savior. And political and kings aren't born in a stable. They're not born around animals. They're not visited by shepherds. And so what they did is they just kind of brushed it off as crazy tales of these shepherds that have been up way too long in the fields. Because they were looking for a different type of Savior. The shepherds were a third reaction. And the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, you can see this, they were in awe. They were amazed at the fact that God Himself had actually come to deliver them. And they spent their time that night telling others where they could find Jesus. And they were so excited to be part of the family moment that night. And the fourth reaction was the wise men. You found we saw that last week in Matthew chapter 2. The wise men, they gave everything. They gave their time and their treasure and their safety to to walk 700 miles from Babylon to Jerusalem. They just brought everything they had to give to this savior and to worship him so again what about us what about your story where do you fit in where do i fit in here's the deal are we like herod you're like there's no way i'm like Herod. like i I don't want to kill baby jesus like that's not me like i would never want to do that but i think as believers we're sometimes more like herod than we want to admit because as a believer we don't want to let christ into all the areas of our life because we don't like the idea of that area of our life having to change. We don't like what Jesus would mean to certain areas of our life. So here's what we do. We want to accept him as our savior because we want to go to heaven. But we keep him at arm's length in all these other areas because we don't like what it means to us to actually maybe have to change. We're like, okay, Jesus, like I'm in Jerusalem and I know you're born in Bethlehem, but I want you for salvation. But if you could go a little further away from Bethlehem, like, couple miles is just too close for me so we might not want to kill baby jesus we don't i would never want to do that but we don't like what he means to certain areas of our life and so we lock him out of certain areas don't change me here don't 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 challenge me to be more committed don't challenge me to be more faithful don't challenge me to actually start sacrificing something of my own talent time and treasure i just no 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 no. salvation yes the rest of it no And we end up falling into this trap of being just like Herod. Maybe we're like the priest. As a believer, we're like, okay, I've come just far enough, I kind of don't need the Messiah anymore. Like, I've kind of arrived. Like, I'm spiritual enough. I've been to enough church services. I know enough songs and hymns. And so I'm good. Like, don't mess with me anymore. I got it. Like, the rest of it can go away. But maybe for some of us, we're more like the religious leaders of that day because we're looking for a different type of Savior. We're looking for a Savior that fits our idea of what the Savior is. Like, Jesus, I want you to come fix my finances. If you can't do it, then you must not be a Savior. Jesus, I want you to come and fix my family. If you can't do it, then you must not be the real Savior. Jesus, I want you to come and make me more important or give me a little more power or let me, give me a little better job. And if you can't do that, then it must not be really God. And we do that too. We're like, man, we're looking for a different type of Savior. Or maybe we can say we're more like the shepherds. Where we're in awe of what Christ has done for us and we're excited to be part of the family. Like, and we can't wait to tell Jesus, tell people where they can find Jesus. They were shepherds. They weren't preachers. They weren't evangelists. They weren't trained orators or public speakers. They were just guys who watched sheep. But yet they went and they spread the message of where people could find Jesus. Jesus. I think sometimes we don't really share Jesus because we're really scared that we have to explain Jesus. But nowhere in Scripture are we commanded to explain Jesus. Our job is just to point people where they can find Jesus. So maybe some of us need to be a little more like the shepherds. I'm just going to point people where they can find Jesus. Because that's who we are as a church. You remember? We're a safe place for people to find and follow Jesus. The fourth reaction, maybe we can say this morning, we're like the wise men. Like we've gone farther than just being in awe and now we've actually brought everything. Like we've sacrificed everything for the one who has given everything to us. Like we bring our talents. 
We're willing to sacrifice our time. We're willing to invest in other people. We're willing to be obedient to the Scripture. We're willing willing to say, you know what, I'm going to give back to God because that's the least that I can do because He's given me eternal life. Herod and the religious leaders that day didn't think they needed any hope. But for those of us who realize that we are broken, for those of us that realize we can't fix ourselves, for those of us who God has got us to the place in life where we realize we don't have the answers, the birth of the Savior, in fact, brings us that thrill of hope. Once again, in 1 Peter, he says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Verse 6, In this we rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, we've been grieved by various trials, because though we haven't seen Him, we love Him. And though we can't see Him now, we still believe in Him, and we rejoice with joy. That's inexpressible. And it's filled with glory. Why? Because the source of our hope is not in what we can do, but it's what what he's already done. Church, can I have you bow your heads and close your eyes this morning for just a moment? Every head bowed and every eye closed. Can I ask you this morning while our, our... our worship team is coming up here. Can I ask you to think about that word hope again? Hope. That excited anticipation of something we know is going to happen. And maybe some of you came in here this morning like, I have no idea what the future holds for me. I have no idea what happens when I die. I have no idea what happens the rest of my life. I have no idea what my purpose in this life even is. I'm just kind of drifting. Can I tell you this morning that there is hope that doesn't fade. It doesn't perish. And it's alive. And that you can have it but it's not found in you and it's not found in me. It's only found in Jesus. The same thing the angel said to the shepherds, fear not, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. A Savior that came not to be born, just to be worshipped by angels and shepherds. Not to be born just to be visited by wise men to make a really neat story for us, but to be born for one reason, to die your death and mine so that we can have a real hope. And maybe some of you this morning, maybe you're struggling with hope. Could it be that you've put your hope in the wrong thing? Could it be that Jesus to you is still just a baby in the manger and not the Lord of your life? So what will you do with Jesus today? Believers, what will you do? If you're here this morning, like John, I know I'm a believer. I know I've given my life to Jesus Christ. I know that he's my Savior. Well, did you see yourself a little bit in one of those responses? Are there areas of your life Believer today that maybe you're kind of keeping Jesus at arm's length. You just don't want him in certain areas. Or maybe other areas of your life, you're just looking for Jesus to show up in a different way and that he's a different kind of savior in your mind other than the savior that wants to redeem your soul. And you're just kind of waiting for him to do what you think he should be doing as a savior. Or can we honestly say today as we sit here in this moment of reflection on hope and Christmas, can we honestly say that in life we're responding like the shepherds and the wise men to this Savior? Our hope hinges on what we do with Jesus. And so if you leave here today with no hope, just like when you came in, 
It's because you haven't responded to the Savior. How are you going to respond? Maybe you're here today and you say, John, I, I don't, I mean, I know Jesus. I mean, I, I heard about him and I know it's Christmas and we celebrate his birth, but to me, that's all he is. He's not my Savior. And I don't have hope. I don't know what's going to happen when I die. I don't know what's going to happen and what God wants for me, what I'm, why I'm even here. This morning, can I tell you, one, listen to me, I love you. But Jesus loves you way more than I do. And he came to die for you. To die your death and to take your penalty of sin. What will you do with him today? If you're here this morning and maybe you're here and you're like, John, that's me. I, Jesus is not my savior, but I want him to be. Listen, I'd love to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to ask you to stand up or anything like that, but will you, nobody's looking. Will you just raise your hand this morning and say, John, that's me. I don't know the Savior, but I want to. Can I pray for you? Will you just slip your hand up and you put it right back down? Is there anybody at all this morning? Believers, let me ask you this. Who are you? And what's your story? Are you Herod? Are you the religious leaders? Are you the wise men and the shepherd? How are you going to respond today? We're going to have just a moment of response. Here in just a minute, I'm going to pray, and everybody's going to stand up, and we're going to sing a, a verse of invitation. And maybe you want to come down this morning and just, man, maybe we kick off the end of this year, starting off next year, responding to the Savior. What a great day to do that. And I'll be down here. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to pray with you if you have something you'd like to pray about. Maybe you want to deal with them right there in your seat, but it's all about how we're going to respond to the one who was born, but he wasn't just born. He came to die. And then he rose again to redeem us. And as believers, that should mean something. It should prompt us to respond every day to this Savior. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your message. We thank you for this time of year that we've set aside to worship and to remember and to celebrate you. The fact that you came and you fulfilled all your promises, which gives us even more hope to believe that you're going to fulfill the promises that are still yet to happen. God, that we can have a rock-solid hope that leads to joy in our life. And God, I know right now, even as I'm talking and even as you're moving in the hearts of your people, there are some people in our, and even in our family, church family today, that God, they're struggling with joy. They're struggling with hope. God, maybe today was just a time to kind of recenter and refocus back on who you are. You got to pray that you'll help us all respond. And I pray, Lord, today, if there's anybody that doesn't know you, that you working in their heart this morning will even cause them to want to give their life to you. That you'll be more than just a Christmas story but you'll be their savior. God, we love you. Thank you for everything you've done, for this amazing church family, and for the awesome worship today. And we give you the rest of this morning for your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me this morning and worship?